Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. And joining me today on the show to discuss his book, The Naked Socialist, is Paul Skousen. Paul, welcome back to the show. Appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. A delight to be here, Robert. Yeah. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice... Uh, educational thick read about 500 plus pages and uh it goes over a lot a lot of history and that's what really kind of drew me to it um so and this is a really a very misunderstood topic that's why i thought it was so important to talk about it but let's talk about the book first the naked socialist and it appears much like your dad's book uh, i believe that was called the communist social or the Com naked yeah. communist yeah, yeah, yeah. Naked Communist. Yeah. And, and that was followed by another book called The Naked Capitalist. Oh, okay. And, and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and so this book is several years old, so it's not like brand new. But uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about uh, why you wrote it and give a little short summary about it? Right. We hear this word socialism bounced around all the time, and everyone has all kinds of viewpoints, all the way from pure Christianity to, you know, pure communism or whatever. There's just no real anchor point. And my father, when he wrote The Naked Communist, he was trying to tell about what Marx and Engels were envisioning as they would bring this terrible idea and flesh it out. So he, he created that with Naked Communist and then he wanted to touch on socialism, which was more the practical implementation of the early steps of communism, but he passed away before he could get to that. So I, I took it on with his notes and tried to show that socialism is more than a recent idea. It's ancient, it's historical, it has a lot of uh, elements to it that have been with us forever. It's not an 18th, 19th century invention. So my purpose was to get down to where I could understand socialism its beginning place and examples of it being used throughout history, how the founding fathers addressed that when they were forming our constitution, how it worked over a period and then became our system became corrupted with more socialistic ideas all the way until we're where we're at today, lockdown. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> all right. So you, you did mention that there's a variety of definitions and types of socialism. So, Paul, what is socialism? And can you talk about some of these variants? Right. Uh, <laughs> boy, this is a long story, but I'll try and make it really short. We've okay. got um, the general idea is controlling other people's property. That's what socialism is. And I... Uh, I give a, my own definition, which is um, it's, it's power given to government to control and change people. It's force, government force to control and change people. Now, a lot of people will define socialism as, as government controlling the means of production and distribution, right? That's the standard definition. But I want to go deeper. What does it take? that government can control manufacturing and control distribution. What is it that's at work here? So my definition is it's nothing more complicated, nothing more simple than force handed to a centralized group operating without our control or our input. And that is the fundamental issue of socialism. Now, uh, is it easy to differentiate um, socialism from communism from fascism? I, um, not at the nuts and at the nuts and bolts level, they're all the same. I, 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 some of the socialistics we have the Fabian socialists, the democratic socialists, the um, there's different names without socialism, any utopian ideas. All of these elements, it's the same as communism. It's the same as fascism. These have seven basic elements that they all have in common. Communism seems to be more of an abstract idea, but it, it just flat doesn't work. We can talk about that, uh, why it hasn't. It was tried here in America and it didn't work. 
whereas socialism seems to involve more of the existing system, more of the free market system that's being marshaled and controlled and manipulated to bring about the desires of a central authoritarian government. So that's why it's sort of hard to pinpoint, but you boil it all down, it's controlling other people's property. That's socialism. Yeah, basically not a dime's worth of difference between them, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and you did mention democratic socialism. That's uh, something that a lot of people like throwing around these days. Uh, some of our more popular uh, <laughs> politicians. And yes. um, But is there truly a difference between classical socialism and democratic socialism? Uh, no. no, there's no difference. That word democratic implies that the people somehow have a, a place to vote. Well, they do. They vote once. They vote it into power, and then it's over. Yeah, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> now, you now, you talked about the seven pillars of socialism. Um, can you go over those? What, what are we on the lookout for when we uh, talk about socialism? Right. Socialism appears throughout history with these seven elements or phases or stages. They can happen at different rates or all at once. The first one to look for is an all-powerful ruler. That can be an individual or it can be a group of some kind. So that that is the first number one thing to watch out for. A monarchy, someone who can declare everything without control by the people. So all-powerful ruler. And then what they do is they divide society into into classes or castes. So the top one is the ruling authority. The next one down is usually the enforcement authority. And then the bottom one, that's the masses. They do all the work. And a, a prime example is Nancy Pelosi out there in, in her little gated community and within half a mile are a bunch of homeless people everywhere. She has her whole big giant fridge full of ice cream. Let them eat ice cream, says Queen Pelosi. Mm -hmm. uh, Pelosi yet, as they say. And, and yet right outside are some people in severe need. She doesn't pay attention. That's the bottom part clashed. And the police won't let them get close to demand relief to her at her upper gated community. That's how a socialist society establishes itself. So ruler, castes or classes, the promise to keep in power is all things in common. So the rich have too much, the poor don't, we're going to make it easier. They call that leveling. The founding fathers said the rich, the poor, we're going to, people that say you can level it, bad, bad, bad idea. So they called socialism leveling back in their writings and their talks. Well, to make all things in common, we go to number four, and you need to be able to have the power to regulate. So you control the prices, you control the supply and the demand. That's Marxism, communism. That's number four. We have that vested now in, in the executive branch of the government, the power to regulate. All compliance is forced. It's not voluntary. In a free society, if we wanted those things, we could ask for it. But in socialism, you are forced. Perfect example of that is Obamacare. You, you have to buy insurance or you'll get penalized, fined. Can you believe that? So that just blows me away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would happen here in America. Uh, number six is control of information. When I first wrote the book and looked at how information was controlled. It was on across the spectrum. You know, the gods needed these things to happen. So in your heart, you would do, you would obey the ruler because the gods wanted it. Or it would simply be the old way never worked. The new way will work better. I promise you. <laughs> so they control information to achieve that. You'll notice that's going on today with what President Trump likes to call the fake news. They're controlling the positive things President Trump is doing by not saying them or distorting. So the last one is no unalienable rights. Uh, God gave us. We were born with certain rights that are ours, and no legislation can morally get rid of those. We were born as individuals, not as slaves. The freedom to choose, uh, acquire, dispose, develop property, uh, companionship, 
uh, choose who we want to associate with, equality of rights among other people, self-defense, things of the heart, compassion, religion, not just to believe, but to act on those beliefs of religion and the freedom to succeed or the freedom to fail from our free choices. Those are the unalienable rights that the founders talked about. Those are all destroyed under socialism. The state takes over everything. So central authority, classes, things in common, all things regulated, compelled by force, control information, no unalienable rights. So those, those are the seven characteristics of socialism. So, so what do you see as the appeal for this very disastrous uh, political philosophical system, um, both throughout history and especially what we're seeing today? Yeah, uh, it's human nature. People, you'll notice if you ask for leadership, ask for volunteers, very few want, want to step forward. It is human nature to like to be told what to do and human nature to take the path of least resistance and just be comfortable to send me that stimulus check. I love that. Let's do that again. <laughs> <laughs> Humans, that's their natural tendency. And uh, may I share a short CIA story? I worked of at course. CIA and we had a uh, we had several people that would defect over. We had one very prominent spy from the Soviet Union who defected. This is during the President Reagan era when I was working there. And This fellow was there for two or three weeks, and then suddenly he shows up on the stairs of a Soviet aircraft uh, airliner headed back to Russia. And Reagan and the CIA and the director of CIA came under enormous criticism. How did you let this guy go? So I talked to one of his handlers, and he told me this much liberty is not a natural state for those people out of the Soviet Union. They are accustomed to being told what to do, when to do it, and they were comfortable. And he gave me example. He said, he called up on a Saturday and said, I'm bored. And and his handler said, okay, well, what do you want to do? I, why, don't you, why don't you go bowling or something? Can I do that? Will I have to show my papers? And then one night at uh, early in the morning, two or three in the morning, he's at a 24 hour shop. He calls up his handler and he says, I, I'm in the store. I, I need some milk and cereal, but I also want to know, can I buy some meat? Do I have to show a coupon or anything to get the meat? And his handler <laughs> was going crazy because he had to hold this fellow by the hand because he didn't know liberty. And it was such a shocking uh, thing. So he was happy to leave and go back to Russia where they would tell you what to do, when to do it, to what degree. Isn't that amazing? That is, uh, that's thoroughly (laughs) out of control. It's, yeah, it's bizarre that anybody, being an American is very hard to even imagine, fathom thinking like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And they were happy, by the way. They were, they're were they happy when these people leave. They said they got about 80% of what they were looking for out of him. So it was okay. Goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you've talked quite a bit about force already, and I haven't even asked you a question about force. But you actually have a whole chapter in the book, The Naked Socialist, uh, about force. And I guess my question is, well, we know that governments inherently uh, come with force. That's part of the thing governments have. Um, what have we seen throughout history with socialism and force? I mean, a few examples, I guess. Yeah, um, France is a good one. Right after our revolution and we got liberty, the French people were going through their revolution and yeah. they had about a decade before Napoleon came, but they wouldn't settle on correct principles. And so they had their tennis court meetings and all these different groups. And the biggest gang came out on top and they said, to make things fair, we will force everybody to charge this price for eggs, this price for bread, this price for milk and cheese, and no other price allowed. So they brought in regulation and that did not stimulate the economy. It just made the people more angry. So there was an an effort to uh, impose by force 
a system of fairness, or so they thought. So that kind of a pattern where people rise to the positions of power, they they lose and lost or don't gain the concept that the people themselves are wise enough to figure this out. So you'll see down through, go into ancient Egypt if you want to with Pharaoh and the cult of the mm -hmm. bee and yeah. upper and lower Egypt and all these kingdoms that were built around telling the people, this is your job, you're raised to do it. If you don't do it, you die, we don't care. And the examples throughout history uh, like that I just told you are enormous. Um, we can bring it up into Jamestown and Plymouth if you'd like to at this point, or I can a little bit later. Okay. Um, yeah, let, let's hold off on the Jamestown for a bit, because and that's a very interesting story, because I don't think a lot of people realize what the those English settlers went through. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's really horrific. But I want to go ahead and go into human rights. And, th and this is kind of funny, because this is a, a term that you hear socialists use frequently uh, for for this, this or that, right? But how is it defined and how does government fit into the issue of rights? Right, so we have two kinds. We have the unalienable that we're all born with and then we have vested rights that the government gives us. And there's a place for both. The challenge the founders had was to balance it so that what government gave as a right or imposed did not conflict with unalienable rights. So when we go out on the road, we want people who have a driver's license. They've been through training. Okay, that makes sense. We got to watch our fisheries. We want to make sure we don't overfish certain areas. So a fishing license, you know, helps maintain the area. Those are vested rights. And so the government, government takes that authority from we the people to put that order into our society so that we don't have, uh, there's, a, there's a fun essay called, uh, is it the tragedy of the commons? I'm gonna mess up that name. <laughs> it was, it's a really great example of, of a green hill with lots of grass and the farmer brings his cows and lets it eat the grass. And the other farmer sees that and goes, hey, I want some of that. Uh, and so he brings his cows. Pretty soon there's so many cows, they eat the grass, they kill it and all the cows have to be sold or slaughtered. And that's the tragedy. There needs to be some order so that not all the grass is eaten just freehand. We need to put some uh, um, structure there. So we rightfully give our government the power to impose those degrees of order. Now, why the Constitution is so beautiful, under socialism, they run it by models all the time. They, you know, we need this much produced because we had too few, too little of that last time. And they don't let the market drive that. Here in the United States, we want our representatives to tell our federal government its involvement. And that's the big difference. So government rights as delivered by our representatives is a whole lot different than government rights delivered by force through a king or a monarch when there are no representatives. Well, I, I found that pretty interesting when I read that in the book because when I look at rights, and of course it's the inalienable rights given by God or nature, whatever your belief system is, right. the purpose of government is to protect those. That That is essentially, the sole purpose of government and government doesn't really have any ability to give rights because they can always take them away. Correct. Yeah. So that's why we, we separate those and call them vested. That's government's effort to bring order. But mm -hmm. when it says uh, property ownership, you know, your first piece of property is your body, right? Does the government have the right to tell you how to use that piece of property? No. They can't make you be a slave. Well, what's the difference between that and your $100 bill? That's also your property. So property, you're absolutely correct. The number one role of government is to protect our private property, your patent, your copyright, your work of art, your you name it, uh, your product. That should be its job. Now, in, in the book, like I mentioned earlier on, um, you do take this 
very comprehensive historical journey uh, through socialism through time. And uh, I did want to touch on Jamestown. And for listeners that may not be familiar, this is the first permanent English settlement, I believe, from 1607. Correct. Uh, in Virginia. Um, but socialism devastated Jamestown, did it not, Paul? Yeah, it absolutely did. They went there with uh, the, the Virginia company. Over in England, they, they set up this business and they said, this is how we want you to run your business. Settle this colony and you will take all of the ele elements, all of the product and produce necessary for survival, put it in the storehouse. Okay, so everything goes in there. And if you need something, it comes out of the storehouse. But when they first arrived, it's a desperate situation. 104 people made it there. 104 got off the ship. So they divided themselves into threes. Uh, you go start a farm, start cultivating the ground, get a farm started so we have food. You go start building the fort because we need protection from the local indigenous people. And the third group, you go find the gold. Well, guess what happened? Everybody, sh not everybody, most shirked their labors because they wanted to go get the gold. That's, mm -hmm. that's, how, that's, that's what we really want. So as the farm sort of started to work and people were eating out of the forest and animals they could hunt and it got to fall time, harvest time, there was not enough food to carry them through the winter because everybody was off doing what they wanted to do. The storehouse was empty and they had both disease and starvation and the locals, the natives there were also attacking periodically. So by the time winter arrived, there was 30 some odd people, 42 I believe, alive by the time springtime rolled around out of 107, 104, all those people had died. So now we have springtime. They're barely hanging on, barely have food. They're waiting for the next shipment of people. So yes, here comes a ship with a few hundred more people. Same story. They didn't want to do the work because they were doing things in common. Fill the storehouse. Who wants to work for another person? The following year, 500 people came over. And that following spring, they went through what they called the starving time. And they had about 60 people left alive. So Sir Thomas Dale was sent over by the British and said, you've got to get this colony settled and cleaned up. So he came in and he said, all right, everybody has to work. No more shirking, no more laziness. And he was strict. He had capital punishment for everything. One guy was stealing food and got caught. He took him out into the woods, chained him around a tree and just walked away to starve to death, to get eaten by animals. And that's what he would do, these draconian measures. Well, a couple of years of that, it's just, he couldn't make the people work. So he decided brilliantly, they are not invested in the land in property. So this is 1613. And so he says, okay, you're all gonna get a piece of land and good luck. And everybody perked up and said, this is fantastic. So he said, the ones who've been here the longest, you get three acres, others get a little bit less, but your only tax is to deliver two and a half barrels of corn. So guess what happened? They abandoned the fort, pretty much. They abandoned the farm, they abandoned gold, and they went to their piece of ground and they plowed it up and they dunged it and they watered it and they planted crops. And they were so excited because it's mine. It's my property. And that fall, they had enough surplus to fill the storehouse from all that they had done using principles of free agency, free will, and property ownership versus socialized, centralized things by force. Such a huge example. So that's, that's close. That's communism, that's socialism, all boiled into one little early settlement. And then, then they discovered tobacco would sell well and they got a cash crop and then things started to grow. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing what happens when incentive is there, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> go ahead, Paul. 
Oh, I just going to say, I just going to say the same thing happened in Plymouth. Yeah, yeah. And and Governor Bradford made this really brilliant comment after he did what the what the uh, Virginia company told him to do, do it with a storehouse and the same thing as Jamestown. Mm-hmm. Pretty soon he gave acre uh, portions of land to the people. They were so sick of it. Why does my young wife have to go clean and cook for this older couple without compensation? Wow, how's that fair? We got our own kids. A lot of complaining. So, so he went ahead and gave people their own land and they did the same thing. The Thanksgiving epic period that we look at that happened just before he he went and issued land and he made this comment to where uh the conceit of plato meaning socialism applied to their little village you know they thought they they thought they were wiser than god then he wrote that in his journal (laughs) says he abandoned socialism plato leveling abandon it and give everybody their property and it took off so, so the, the the settlers in in Jamestown and the settlers in Plymouth, it, was this just um, a philosophy that was common in England at the time, and they just brought it with them? This communal. Uh, it it wasn't as common there, but it was being approached like a business would approach it. Mm. You know, we're going to invest this money, and we expect these returns, and you're going to do the. You each have your job. And so they controlled it in that fashion. The concept was certainly not new, but uh, there's more of a free market going on in England than there was at Jamestown or Plymouth. Okay. Um, You also talk uh, about the founders. You've talked a little bit about the founders already. Um, What did they write and what did they say about, um, what were their thoughts on socialism? Yeah, they, uh, they recognized it immediately that it's a failure system. They said leveling and utopian ideas of trying to bring equality uh, fail. And I've got 16, 17 quotes from the various founders commenting on that, how it just won't work because it takes away the incentives of private property ownership. And if the government were to step into that, they wrote, and try to impose that on the people, then there would be failure and an uprising and the American experiment would completely collapse. So they were totally against it, did not use the word socialism, used the word leveling and things in common. And and the founders were all great students of world history. And, and And they looked at all these different countries in these political systems and just saw how disastrous they were. So yeah, clearly, yeah. I mean, they had to take a, a separate uh, turn, and that's how we got this country, which is by far the most unique um, political system ever. Right, and the 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 brain melting part of this whole thing is it's common sense. It's common sense that you want your own property and to have government be able to take it away and say we're going to take care of you. <laughs> common sense and yet it was practiced millennia after millennia after millennia and that really brings me to my next question and you write quite a bit about and i wasn't quite as much aware of this is the relationship with religion and socialism throughout the centuries and um there, there was quite a connection right yeah, z- zero connection between religion and socialism, except on the surface where people pretend. They say socialism is compassionate. It helps the poor and it's good. And so, yeah, everybody should be donating. Well, that's the problem. Everybody should be donating. You get government, the iron fist of government, and they t- change the should to will. Right. So when Jesus taught, his gospel. He spoke of out of the goodness of your heart and your love of your fellow being, come help them. Be compassionate. You yourself could be there. Let's try and organize ourselves and see if we can't work it together voluntarily, where socialism says, nope, by force. And so um, the short answer is no, they have nothing in common. And those who say there is do not understand religion as taught by Jesus and do not understand what socialism is. 
So uh, Jesus was not a socialist, as many would like to say. Absolutely not. He was yeah. on the absolute opposite side. You keep your property. <laughs> yeah. Vo- said, v- voluntary association all yeah. the way. Yeah. Bring a sacrifice to the temple. It's your sacrifice. It's called mm-hmm. sacrifice because <laughs> it's your property. Yeah. And, and, and that's really interesting because there's always been this sort of link between social the in socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, with replacing God with the state. Um, can you talk about that at all? Right. Yeah. Marx viewed religion and the family and local communities as the great inhibitor of real progress, of valuing the true labor of the true laborer. So he said these principles of work ethic, et cetera, and religion, that comes from mom and dad. So we got to tear down the family, let the state raise the family. The church, certainly, that propagates these ideas of independence and worshiping God. So we don't want that. Tear down the church. The state represents lots of communities working in harmony with a government that they elect. And that doesn't allow government to step in and control the individual and solve these problems of inequality and unfairness. So the family, church, and state under communism have to be replaced with communist leadership. And everywhere that's been tried, complete failure and the people are wasted. All this human capacity in China, in Russia, in North Korea, all this human capacity flushed down the toilet because of that system. Yeah. Um, uh, a document that both of us uh, admire quite a bit is the Constitution, and of course that includes the Bill of Rights. An amazing document. However, uh, in your book you do talk about some of the amendments, and maybe they're not so amazing. Can you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, <they're, laughs> we've made some stupid steps on trying <laughs> to fix the Constitution. You know, there's there's a reason those framers were so brilliant in their own personal lives, so well read. You mentioned that. Talk, look at history and see what systems work and didn't. They tried to protect the Constitution from stupidity. And unfortunately, the amendment process has undone a lot. So the 16th Amendment. Um, there's th- three, the three main uh, truly severe amendments are the 14th, the 16th, and 17th. So let me just start with the 14th. Sure. Uh, that was one of the healing the country amendments. So after the Civil War, we had the 13th, 14th, and 15th. You know, no slavery, and then people, that wasn't good enough. They were still treating the slaves like slaves. And so the next one was, if you're born into this country, you're a citizen with all the rights. And if your state passes a law that's contrary to the United States view of what a citizen should have, that's illegal. Now, this is what the Supreme Court did to turn this nation upside down on that idea. Here in my state, we don't like abortion. And a vast majority has voted against abortion. Well, what happened was someone went to the Supreme Court and said, I want to get an abortion. It was actually in Texas. I want to get an abortion there, but it's against the law. And so the Supreme Court said, well, let's look at the 14th Amendment. It says any law by a state that violates the United States ideas is not legal. We think abortion should be available to everybody. Therefore, the Texas law is unconstitutional and we get abortion. So the 10th Amendment says all the powers go to the states or the people. Abortion is not mentioned in the Constitution. So the Supreme Court had to had to use this a roundabout way saying, you guys have passed a law in Texas and it violates what we think the rights should be. So you're in violation. That's mm-hmm. due process. We examined it. We've met the requirements. All right. That's not what that was intended to do. Poorly written, and it's been used that way ever since. So that's the 14th. Got to rewrite that or fix it. It's also the one that has the anchor baby where you just have to be born and your child, 
you can be illegal immigrants and child born has rights and that's not what it was intended for either so the 16th amendment when the founders said we're going to uh, raise money they expected the government federal government to raise money off of uh, taxes and fees off of international trade negotiation deals if they had to tax the people it was supposed to be a, that direct tax was supposed to be equal to everybody well what do you do about someone who's really poor and someone who's really rich is a thousand dollar tax fair to both of those so they left it inside the state to decide so it was proportional to the population of the states. So they would decide if the rich or they would say, okay, these go these will get a little bit more, you know, they could decide. Well, the 16th Amendment came along in, in an effort to bring more revenue into government, and that gave government the power to reach into our wallets individually, wallets and purses, and take money graduated income tax go look up the planks of the communist party mm -hmm. and a sp written by marx right. and angles and you will see graduated income tax that's where we are today so the 16th amendment has allowed the government to really grow however it's not growing based on all this new money coming in it's growing because of debt so our deficit has been skyrocketing ever since the 16th Amendment was passed. So this is screwy. So the founders knew these kinds of issues would happen, so they nailed it down. And you can read that in Article 1. They describe how to handle taxation. The 17th Amendment broke the back of our Constitution, sadly. We're supposed to be a representative government. You and I go to vote for our state legislature, senators and representatives. Those individuals, their job to stay in office is to look at our state's problems and work them over as the legislative body. Once they decide, they take a representative and send the representative out to Washington to represent those views for our state. Guess who that rep is? It's our it's senator. Senators. Mm -hmm. Yep, our two senators for each state. Well. The 17th Amendment took away the power of the legislature to pick their own representative. They can hire or fire the senator. They, they used to be. So, hey, you didn't vote the way we wanted you to vote. You're fired. And we'll put a new guy in there, a new gal, whatever. The 17th Amendment said the legislature no longer picks that representative. Now the whole state votes for the senators. So what does a senator do and say to win election? Anything the people want to hear, and they're in there for six years. So we no longer have that linkage, people to the legislature, to the federal government, that's gone. And now we just have another essential, essentially a representative, and uh, we've got to get the 17th repealed, make our senators responsible to our legislators. The founders wanted that link of control all the way to the top mm -hmm. 17th amendment broke it yeah 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 um and just for uh, people that are listening or watching uh it, it is interesting to look at the 10 planks from marx because uh, yeah. you can see i mean basically in the united states we have achieved all those 10 planks from the government taking over education to a central bank and and i can't list them all right now but yeah we're, we're there Exactly. We yeah. are. And it's it's a tragic. Yeah. Um, the courts, uh, Paul, um, how have the courts been concerning upholding the Constitution and, and fulfilling their constitutional role? Yeah. Um, started out pretty good. And then the lack of attention by the people, I guess you might call it, allowed the courts to begin to change the constitution and instead of interpreting we all we hear this all the time instead of interpreting uh, they they formulated new law and we say well what does all that mean well abortion is a perfect example it's not in the constitution the supreme court should have said we have no rule ruling here it belongs down to the states they didn't so over the decades and 
maybe starting in the 18, mid 1800s, the Supreme Court started to take more and more power and start to tell the other two branches, you can and you cannot do this. Now, Thomas Jefferson beautifully expressed his worry that that would happen. He would have, he said, instead of getting rid of one king, now we've got six or nine kings, mm -hmm. you know, in the form of the Supreme Court right. telling us what to do. You need a check and balance. And he had some ideas for that. But slowly, the, the judiciary has eroded away. And there's these watermark periods where they interpret things that are not in the Constitution and it becomes law. Uh, one of them that just really boils my blood, most of us have forgotten about. Juries used to have the power to interpret the law. So if they see a person come in uh, guilty of some crime and the law says because you are of Asian descent, you know, for example, uh, you can't do these things because you're black. You can't do these things. The jury could rule on the law for that particular case. And they could say, we find this person innocent because we don't agree with the law. That's a power juries used to have and that it would get judges, activist judges, so angry so they began to slowly erode away that power. And the judge would say, when you go in session as a jury, you are only allowed to talk about the innocence or guilt of this person in relation to the law. That was his instructions. And if you didn't follow those, then he would call it a mistrial and start over. So a lot of people don't know juries used to be able to have that power. I didn't either. <laughs> yeah. And, and now it's gone. So, yeah, that the, the judicial has caused tremendous damage uh, to our country. Yeah. Okay, well, let, let me go ahead and close with this question. And uh, I want to get your thoughts on this. I was born in the early 1960s. Um, what are the three most socialist administrations in my lifetime, in your view? Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, if, you, if you if you can only come up with two, or, or if you can come up if you can come up with ten, whatever it is, <laughs> you know, here's that's that's a really great question. Certainly, Obama is at the top of the heap. You go through and you look at all the violations of the Constitution that he performed and committed while he was in office, and it's a misuse of funds and putting himself in positions of authority had his resume, whatever he was doing, um, Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare, his list is long and ugly. So it's pretty easy to say he was a big government guy. And, uh, and that was, you know, the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law to come out and say, we're not a Christian nation because our constitution doesn't say we are a Christian nation and throw away our entire history and the foundation the founders said, our constitution won't work except for a religious people. I mean, and it's true. It's not working as we move that other direction. Okay, so Obama's on top. And then I looked at the others. So many of the other presidents since the 1960s have uh, used the trend towards socialism as part of their onward governing of the country. It's kind of hard to, to take them out. Uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, he was a, a pretty dirty guy in his personal life and in his political life. And he would wield power and he would force and push and shove. I would say he acted more like a monarch than did President Obama. Uh, Jimmy Carter surprised me. Jimmy Carter came in and he deregulated the airlines, communication, railroad, and a few other things. And deregulation, guess what happened? ticket prices and costs went down because of competition. So you would say he's one, isn't he? Well, not in that case. No, not at all. So you see in the different administrations, different actions. Uh, I've been uh, a little worried about President Trump. I wouldn't put him in this category at all. <laughs> I think he's helping the country in so many good ways. Um, but when he says all power here when it's not. That's very concerning, yeah. 
yeah, that that bothers me. And I think if he understood a, the Constitution, I have a book on how to read Constitution. I want to send him and see if he'll read it. <laughs> he really should. Yeah, yeah. That, I think I do think that's one of his problems. He just doesn't know. Right. Um, but one person that I was wondering if you were going to mention was going to be Nixon because oh. Nixon was a real big government guy. Most yeah. people don't think of him that way. Yeah. Um, Go Thank ahead, you. Thank you. I totally agree. I'm thinking in terms of the Vietnam War and everything else. He did. He's He expanded his persona over the whole government, thinking that was the way to achieve. Just a wage and price controls. And right. uh, because of Nixon, we don't have a gold standard today. And, you know, just, just a lot of things. And, I mean, most people think, well, he's a Republican. Well, well yeah, but he governed like a democrat on most yeah. things yeah. anyway i just didn't know which i was wondering if you were going to mention him or not yeah thank you i should have and, <laughs> okay. and another contrast if i can tell you real quick was president sure. kennedy you would say okay that's a democrat yeah uh, but i have some great quotes from him where he said things like in a recession you do not raise taxes you lower them you give the money back to the people from Kennedy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah, that's, no. That's, that's pretty well documented, though. I mean, even, you even hear people in the cable news world talk about, you know, if Kennedy was alive today, he couldn't be in the Democratic Party. Right. Yeah. yeah totally so, agree. Yeah. Totally agree. So, yeah. Anyway, um, let me go ahead and show the book one more time. It's called The Naked Socialist by Paul Skousen, and I'll link to it in the show notes. So uh, if listeners would like to go ahead and check it out. Uh, be my guest. It's worth the read. Um, very enjoyable, very educational. And I want to thank you, Paul Skousen, for sharing your thoughts with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Robert, thank you. I love it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And hope, hopefully we'll get to talk again. It won't take a year again. <laughs> <laughs> if we're in quarantine, who knows? <laughs> who knows? All right. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. Thanks, Robert. Appreciate it. <laughs>